And yes, I think we are. We are live now. Maybe. Yes, we are live. Okay. Hello, I warmly welcome you to our 30th webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. My name is Sabine Heinz and I am the person responsible for our webinar series. On this 5th of uh, December, oh, sorry, I have to put, yeah, uh, to mute my, my <laughs> iPad. Uh, on the 5th of the December, I'm really delighted that you have come to join us and we have uh, people watching from UK and the others still have not uh, written in the chat where they are watching from. Uh, our today's special guest is Dr. Denise Afonso Rivero. Hello and welcome. Hello. And he will speak today about uh, his book, Water in Space, the Third Underground. Uh, I also would like uh, warmly to uh, welcome uh, our um, founder and vice president, Adriano Ortino. Hello. Hello. Hello, Sabine. Yeah. Hello, and uh, Denise, uh, <clears throat> before I give you the floor, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Uh, okay. Dr. Denise Afonso Rivero investigated connections between oceans and space exploration at the scientific and industrial levels, focusing on novel ways to develop permanent human settlements. Uh, the ideas have been developed very gradually uh, since 1985 and first published on this subject in 1988 in the US and in 1999, 1990 in Europe. <clears throat> Dennis got his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Government at the University of uh, Austin in Texas. And he keeps researching for a PhD in political science at Lusophone University of Humanities and Technologies. The theme is a comparative study of the mechanisms uh, underlying the development of national space agencies in different countries. Uh, new models of organization of scientific exploration and uh, industrial development of outer space and um, also in comparative study of uh, activities in various extreme environment, environments uh, in different countries. <clears throat> Sorry. Dini's skills and uh, knowledge include scientific exploration and industrial development projects in extreme environment like deserts, polar regions, disaster areas, sea, oceans, underwater activities, aeronautics, and space. Uh, and as well as geopolitical studies focusing uh, in industrial development and scientific policy. policy. Uh, Dennis, uh, the floor is yours. You may share your screen. Okay, well, uh, good evening. Okay, I'm going to go ahead then and uh, share the screen. Hang on. There we go. And... Uh, we can start, I think it should, there you go. So if is is all okay, you can yes. see clearly. Perfect. Okay, so, um, well, uh, this first image is, is supposed to illustrate the fact that these rocks and this water could be anywhere in the solar system. Can you make your, your audio a bit louder because... Uh... Uh, I'm trying, hang on, mm, I'm pushing, okay, now I have it at, at 100%, is, is that okay now? I, I can be, all right, okay, so uh, as I was saying, this first image, uh, I wanted to uh, point out that it actually could be anywhere in the, in the solar system, um, and that's a little bit the, uh, the main idea behind some of the things I'm going to share with you. Um, and therefore, um, as, as you can see, there's the um, Earth, the Moon, and Mars. And uh, in sociological studies, there's the mainstream and then there's the underground. 
the underground is uh, um, not so visible. It's uh, an area that uh, later on, sometime in the future, ends up becoming the mainstream. But um, and that's uh, now the there's the Mars Society, uh, the Moon Society, several uh, various organizations aiming to colonize the moon. And then on Earth, somehow the underwater underground has also been around, but never materialized in such a clear cut definition. And, um, and therefore here on, um, on the right, you can see the first publication uh, in Europe where I address uh, those issues. And it was in 1990. And um, I um, ask you to note a small detail, you have uh, space and sea, and you have, uh, as you can see, you can have, you, you, you can see there's an umbilical cord between the, the uh, diver with an old equipment and the astronaut. Uh, the whole uh, point that I'm trying to, uh, that I, I want to explore together with you is that that umbilical uh, is more meaningful than it might seem. It's not just a small gimmick for graphics. And uh, I'm going to suggest it's actually a super organism that according to some authors, it has been described as the technium. And, um, and that uh, should there be such a super organism, some people call it Gaia, but it's not exactly the same thing really. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on it right now, but uh, let's just for the sake of argument, Imagine there is uh, things that we don't know about the connection. And I'm going to share some ideas about um, what can be done. Um, I'm going to, this is about the approach I'm following. And this, this approach is a bit unusual. Um, I read when I was 20 years old, I, I read the book, Advice to a Young Scientist. Uh, where it was suggested that we would not uh, be a good idea to read everything there was about uh, all topics uh, because then we would be formatted and we would start thinking uh, along the same lines uh, as, as, the, um, as everyone else. And um, another way to express that uh, is the 10th man rule, if there's a very strange idea uh, that seems counterintuitive, uh, well, it's maybe worth it to really, really have someone check it out fully. And this is a little bit what I've been doing. So I've deliberately explored uh, less normal and less common approaches. And the, the third image is from the... Galapagos Islands, the finch, the, the birds, the nose of the birds that evolved differently. And uh, one of the ways they managed to be different is they, they were separate. And, and therefore, uh, uh, I have been able, I've been given the possibility to have a more, uh, a, less, uh, a less atypical career. And I could have focused on more normal research areas. Uh, but I deliberately uh, kept uh, exploring uh, less, um, less mainstream, uh, like many other people that are part of various undergrounds. And, and by the way, uh, coming back here, okay, you hear, you see the Earth, uh, the Moon, and Mars, but there are people that think we should go to Venus. So there's actually a small Venus underground. And likewise, uh, there's also the Lagrangian L5 uh, libration points uh, underground, which is uh, is also uh, is also part of the whole ecosystem. So I'm just uh, uh, this uh, underwater underground can well be the third underground, but there might be a fourth and a fifth. Uh, so it's just to to okay to uh, highlight that aspect. Now here. Uh, I will share with you some of the um, uh, things I've been uh, using as reference in, in my research work. Uh, one of the concepts 
is this this idea of extreme environments. And um, back in 1991, uh, there was a conference in Houston. And then uh, on the other uh, side, as you can see, there was a stress on environment extreme, uh, stress in extreme environments in 2001 in, uh, in uh, Toulouse uh, during one of the International Astronomical Federation conferences. Uh, and um, in those 10 years, uh, several things were attempted and, um, and it was very interesting to see how, how things, um, how things develop. Uh, then uh, there's uh, a whole angle, a, a whole approach uh, to the various problems, which I can label generically as uh, numerous bottlenecks. Uh, and so in my work, I, I see bottlenecks and I see fibrillation in the sense that various uh, muscles in the heart they can contract quite vigorously, but they're not in sync. And so the blood doesn't flow. Uh, the moon uh, exploration uh, has been now uh, finally uh, is, is going again, but, but it was not for lack of trying. And a lot of groups uh, pushed their agendas, uh, sometimes the Mars missions versus the moon missions, whatnot. But, but the whole thing is that uh, um, part of the, those uh, bottlenecks and part of those, um, uh, let's say, fibrillation phenomenon, they're also connected with a whole uh, an idea that was put, uh, published by Robert Fuller, uh, which is the rankism and, and uh, has to do with uh, various problems that are like a common denominator on many dysfunctional situations in uh, space programs in all, all over the world. It's not just A, B, or C. It's I'm, I'm looking for similarities and I found some interesting things that I need to keep um, developing the, the ideas. Uh, another uh, angle is the whole level, uh, the, the, the issues around cooperation and evolution. Uh, many times people, the social Darwinists, they forget that cooperation is, is as important as mutation and as important as natural selection of the life forms that are uh, more uh, viable, uh, adjusted to that environment. But so uh, cooperation and mutation are equally important, one third, one third, one third. And uh, a lot of people focus on, um, on only on, on the aspects of, um, um, of competition and, and they forget the cooperation. Um, another uh, aspect uh, that I've um, used is the whole notion of chaotic organizations. I'm not gonna dwell on it because we don't have time, but it's, it's uh, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, then there's the grassroots uh, real grassroots versus astroturfing, uh, you, you know, the uh, fake grass in, uh, in the Houston Stadium, the Astrodome. <laughs> and uh, it became a political science uh, staple to analyze many, many, many interesting things. Uh, going on with the, the next, um, okay, I'm trying to move the, Okay, here we go. So uh, now uh, a little bit more in depth to the uh, to the whole issue of the underwater and the ground. Um, I got interested in the underwater and the ground uh, because I uh, got in touch with the oil industry and the underwater exploration in, in Texas uh, as a student. 
um, back in 1983, one of my teachers had been a lawyer that worked on Conestoga one, uh, the first uh, rocket that was uh, private, uh, privately launched from South Padre Island. And uh, he, he suggested I, he gave me a book to, to read and I read the whole book in uh, 1993. Uh, by William Sims Bainbridge, The Spaceflight Revolution, a sociological study. And that was the departure point uh, for, for a number of studies that I've, I've been um, cultivating. And, and, but um, basically, the spaceflight revolution suggests that there's a normal evolution, and then there's revolutionary people like uh, Werner von Braun or Elon Musk nowadays that totally changed the way things were going. And uh, he, he, suggests, he suggested that uh, the things would slow down and they did for 50 years. So clearly he, he's got some reason in his criticism, uh, but there was something missing. And, and uh, my uh, idea of technium and the, um, or, or let me explain, uh, the use of the superorganism technium as a possible way to reconcile these two uh, tendencies, the evolution and the revolution, um, I've, I've been finding it increasingly interesting. Um, as a teenager, I was deeply, deeply, deeply influenced uh, by uh, L'Encyclopédie Cousteau and uh, I, I would dream a lot about the whole idea of people returning to, to the ocean. One of the uh, volumes of the encyclopedia is just all focused on that, on that, um, on that issue. And, and it really, really um, uh, uh, how can I say, the whole idea that I've expressed initially um, in the United States was expanding the concept of space program. And basically the idea was to have space colonies like the L5 colonies underwater and to have them detached completely from Earth. So they'd be outside Earth, but still inside the same planet. Uh, and uh, in Houston, there was a Sazakawa Space Architecture Institute. And uh, there were people... Uh, exploring the cybernetic architecture, buildings that would grow, uh, secrete uh, several things. And uh, you can see there an image of the miniature that was used in the movie, The Abyss, that uh, embodied uh, the futuristic uh, research for ocean colonies. Uh, and the movie was from 1989. Uh, then you can see the full-scale underwater colony or underwater habitat that was used uh, for the um, for that movie, The Abyss, uh, it was um, built inside an uh, empty uh, nuclear power plant vessel, um, and um, and and so that was the first iteration of ocean colonies. Um, but uh, the designs I've been developing uh, since uh, 1989 uh, are different, um, but they have some similarities with, with this, uh, this movie, nevertheless. Uh, then I was deeply influenced by the, the suit. The suit is from a Canadian company, and uh, it's, um, it was the initial idea that you, one could have a spacesuit that would work underwater and in outer space. And by selling lots of underwater suits, you would lower the cost of space suits. And, and then there would be a connection, an industrial connection, an economic connection that would enable, that would bring in money enough to build things outside the planet. So with the profit from the underwater colonies, one would easily fund space colonies. That was more or less uh, my ideas and the other people that had similar ideas at that time. Um, on the upper corner, you can see what the Italian Space Agency did in Africa, in Kenya, the San Marco uh, launch site. 
Uh, and uh, as everyone knows, nowadays Elon Musk is buying um, offshore oil rigs to launch things. So, uh, and uh, on the uh, lower uh, right-hand corner, uh, there's a checkup uh, oil rig that I almost managed to buy so that in Portugal, we would have the ability to launch sounding rockets and do underwater research a little bit along the lines of some of the things that I've illustrated uh, on the small uh, uh, corners that was attempted in 1988. Um, and uh, people said it was very futuristic. Uh, but the main thing is that I always had the intuition that there was something more and uh, not just the ocean and sea, uh, the, the ocean and space connection, but that connection was part of uh, an industrial sprawling uh, tendency that um, I'm going to mention uh, next. Okay, so let's see if I can advance the slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So um, I'm not going to dwell too much on this slide. I'm just going to say that um, in terms of humans living out of Earth, but still inside the planet, the crews of nuclear submarines, they are outside Earth, so to say. But, uh, and uh, a lot of interesting things about isolation. And, uh, and so in a way, they are they're space colonists. Uh, moreover, as it's well known, a number of commanders of International Space Station were submarine commanders. And, and so um, there's, there's an, a whole area there. Um, and, and in terms of uh, the underwater underground, one of the branches of the underwater underground is clearly people that also know a lot about submarines. Um, one thing that I want to say right now is that there was a time uh, in the early 90s when uh, I was discussing with the various Portuguese authorities the possibility to have uh, an international space station underwater uh, along the lines of uh, Fabien Cousteau uh, nowadays is uh, continuing that approach. Um, and at that time, uh, there was a country that said, hey, look, we have submarines. You can use one of our uh, decommissioned submarines as part of that underwater space station. Uh, I also had lawyers that had, uh, they told me they might get funding to study the possibility to have an underwater penal colony. Uh, so um, there's uh, different ideas. Uh, what to do in those underwater colonies, uh, that's for sure. So anyhow, I'm not going to, because there's many other slides I don't want to, uh, but uh, I'll leave it at that. I can explore those de in greater detail. Um, now I need to mention um, two ongoing uh, areas of research, uh, one in Italy, the other one in France, uh, the um, that have... Uh, well, I mean, I think it's revolutionary potential. Um, and uh, uh, Barbara Mazzolai uh, has been involved with the European Space Agency. Uh, I, I met Tobias that was doing biomimicry studies at uh, one of the International Astronautical Conferences in 2008. And um, I learned about the study of roots as anchoring mechanisms for asteroids and, and other things that had been funded by European Space Agency Advanced Concepts um, the Department. Uh, and uh, since then, many ideas have been brewing uh, and there are several implications on, on that work that have been growing slowly, uh, but steadily. Um, also, uh, more recently, uh, I met a, a French researcher um, that is uh, doing uh, research with CNES and IFREMER on um, aquaculture on the moon. 
and and there's a lunar hatch program. Uh, you can see the eggs of the fish, and then you can see uh, pictures of aquariums in the International Space Station. Uh, these aquariums are way too small to to what I have in mind, and I do hope one day there will be much bigger structures. Um, but anyhow, these these are two areas that I'm uh, currently uh, uh, working uh, not uh, in the political science, but as a CAD drafter and as a generalist uh, working with various specialists uh, exploring uh, unconventional solutions. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to go back to the neo-Luddism. Um, which is a tendency that exists today. And uh, my goal here is to start exploring uh, that possible connection, uh, that idea of uh, uh, technium. Um, okay, so uh, a lot of people uh, study uh, termite mounts. Uh, when I was in 2009, uh, I was involved on a European Space Agency bid uh, for uh, the design of uh, moon uh, building uh, uh, using lunar regolith uh, building components for a moon base. And uh, Rupert Soar, a researcher from England, had been studying uh, termite mounds. And uh, termite mounds are a lot more interesting than one might think. Uh, there, I suggest that there's a movie called The Sand Wars, a documentary. Uh, and uh, it uh, addresses the appetite this uh, super organism, this technium has for uh, sand. And, uh, um, and uh, you can see some of the images of uh, urban sprawl, houses growing uh, everywhere. Uh, almost like a living plant. And that's the whole idea. It's uh, uh, instead of calling it Gaia, uh, which is restricted to living things, uh, this uh, uh, notion of uh, superorganism broadens the issue. And I hope it will um, be interesting um, in the sense of providing new results on, on different approaches. Uh, then you, you see the picture with the Eiffel Tower. Uh, that's a thought-provoking image. Apparently, all humans, all human beings, if they were transformed in a giant hamburger, could occupy that volume. And then you can see, so their humankind is not that big uh, in uh, more ways than one. And what we see on the surface of the planet is clearly not just people is what grows together with people. A little bit like uh, coral polyps being the people and the coral reefs being the rocky structures. It's just that they're buildings, they're not uh, coral rocks. But, but anyhow, uh, so uh, then you have the water, the air on earth, uh, and then you have a picture of a soap bubble. A soap bubble, uh, which is uh, a thought-provoking description of the biosphere. And uh, we tend to think that the sky is huge, that the oceans are, are very deep, but they're not. They're very shallow. The, we live really uh, on a soap bubble. And uh, you can see the composite image. And the biosphere is about one thousandth of the diameter of planet just as thin as a surface of bulb, soap bubble that size and so a uh, metaphor to illustrate ins instability and fragility um okay so um there was a book that really influenced me uh by alfred bester called tiger tiger uh and um the cover of the portuguese edition uh, uses a painting by a British uh, painter. Uh, and uh, then in the center of the image, there is something that always 
uh, interested me. Uh, in that story, there's a description of a thing called the Sargasso asteroid, which was an asteroid built up with trash from uh, human exploration of space. This drawing is really not the best one. I would not have drawn it that way, but it exists already. And it's an illustration of the current conception about things. So uh, I used it, although what I have in mind looks different. Uh, nevertheless, it's similar. And, and then I also mentioned the uh, 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 francophone, uh, the bande dessinée, uh, the Valerian Lorlin, the point central uh, in uh, the ambassador of shadows uh, as uh, a way to look at, at that idea. Uh, on the bottom, you can see a picture of the, um, of the uh, movie that was made, uh, which uh, is to me, well, it's, they're just illustrations of the idea of uh, building things in space using trash. But if you think it's a super organism, then you're using tendrils you're using tentacles, you're using seeds, you're using parts that are uh, not trash at all. They're the same way leaves are not trash in the sense that they are, uh, they melt in the hum humus and then they feed the roots of trees. So um, uh, the whole notion of space trash to me uh, is uh, slightly old fashioned. Uh, anyhow, this is just to illustrate uh, one aspect. And as you can see, the, this is pretty dry. And what I have in mind is to, um, to explore the possibility to create an orbital lake. Because if we have enough water in outer space, uh, we can do things that are impossible right now. Uh, large human populations require much more than the ice on the moon and on Mars. Of course, you can synthesize and all that, but according to the way I see it, and in assuming there is such a thing as a superorganism, and that we are part of it, uh, humans are part of it. So all the 80% of the water inside humans are uh, part of it. So human expansion is basically also the super organism expansion. And therefore the most natural thing to do would be to send a lot of water. In this design, you have an, a cannon. Uh, some people thought about using a rail gun. Other people think about using hydrogen, which is much more economical, but basically you can launch uh, water. This, this was initially designed to send propellant. Uh, propellants into uh, propellant farms uh, that would be in orbit uh, to support space types, which is fine, but it's still not going all the way with the idea. And what I have in mind is something uh, at a much larger scale, similar a little bit to the slightly uh, debatable <clears throat> idea of nuking, uh, you know, for Elon Musk, nuking the, the the polar caps on Mars to produce water. Uh, that's a bit violent. And of course, everyone uh, did uh, a lot of calculations and the radiation and everything it was. But the, the, the design idea is there. And there is a lot of water in, in the solar system. Uh, so uh, it's, it's perfectly possible to imagine an orbital ocean, an orbital lake uh, created by uh, farming water in asteroids, comets, and deliberately creating a, a sphere of orbiting water not too far from Earth that would provide uh, water as a propellant, uh, water as a construction material, uh, as, as, as most people are aware, uh, you know, on Mars it's very cold and uh, uh, water can be used for 3D printing with ice 
And so it's just a very strange idea. It's not your common uh, moon base, not your common Mars base, not even really the same um, designs of the O'Neill cylinders and 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 the most uh, usual things what i what i've what i've been able to envision looks strange looks different uh but something along those lines uh might be actually be doable and uh and uh, the implications uh i think uh should be studied um i'm going to explore a little bit in greater depth the um the the whole uh, idea of the technium the super organism uh you can see the idea of the seventh kingdom the technium uh i've used uh, this diagram the seventh kingdom uh back in 2003 at the uh an event from european space agency and the international academy of astronautics where i depicted ice crafts and a number of things uh, which I'm not addressing right now, but are deeply related to to these uh, all these ideas. Uh, anyhow, you can see the internet, uh, a way to visualize the internet, and the computer tree with all the different computer models. Uh, then all, also the idea of evolution uh, from uh, Virgin Galactic uh, logo. Um, which is also uh, a way to to address this uh, would be super organism that would include Gaia, including all living material, all the mud, all everything, but not excluding man-made things. And uh, this ain't no technological breakdown. Oh no, this is the road to hell. There's a, a music, a song by Chris Ria that uh, addresses the nightmarish uh, aspects of uh, an uncontrolled superorganism that grows by itself without uh, sufficient human interaction and uh, and uh, the uh, bottling uh, factory uh, in portuguese and in french uh, in portuguese we we talk about engarrafamento and in France, uh, people talk about embouteillage, which is the factory, you know, feeling. So uh, the, anyone that has been caught up in a traffic jam knows very well they're in the grips of something that's sort of evil and mean, or maybe just doesn't care about us that much. And it's uh, the same way a forest fire can be very detrimental for our lungs. Uh, so these things, they have a will of their own and they're neutral. They're not good or evil. They just are. And, um, and I invite you, uh, in case you haven't seen, I would invite you to look at, to watch a very interesting movie with music from um, Philip Blass, uh, Haunting Music, Koyani uh, Skatsi, Life Out of Balance. It's also from the early 80s. Um, and it's presented by Francis Ford Coppola. And in that movie, uh, it's really, uh, well, the, the tagline until now, never really seen the world you live in. This movie really influenced me uh, when I saw it. And uh, little by little, uh, I've now been able to uh, think about new ideas, uh, in part because of this movie. And the movie uh, highlights or describes uh, the, the, the growth of cars of, and uh, one of the most easy ways to imagine the super organism is to uh, see the most visible parts or more clearly visible. And the cars and streets are, are uh, you know, this is not an O'Neill cylinder. <laughs> But uh, the the streets seem to go on a curved uh, path. Uh, nevertheless, now in the dehumanizing aspects and the cautionary tales, uh, there's something I want to share also. There's a science fiction story uh, by uh, the French, Les Manches Bitume, uh, that uh, really 
really is scary because it uh, describes things that are happening now. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, anyone uh, concerned about the role of humans and, and how we can uh, bring out the best that we can into the future, really. Uh, but I, I'm not going to explore all the details. I just wanted to mention that I, I think this really addresses some key issues uh, that um, a lot of people just look at them superficially. And uh, in that movie, Koyani Skatsi, uh, Life Out of Balance, there is a moment where you see uh, you know, like in 2001, A Space Odyssey, you see the uh, primitive human throwing the bone into the air and then the bone turns turns into a spacecraft. In this movie, Koyani Skatsi, uh, one, is, one is able to see a city, a cityscape uh, being zoomed at night and, uh, and then it turns into a motherboard of a computer. Uh, and uh, and that is an artistic, beautiful illustration of uh, what that superorganism might look like and how it, it all works in ways that are beyond our uh, ability to track. Uh, this this um, this uh, text is just a piece of data that that uh, uh, siphon your spiritual energy. A lot of people. Um, are you know going back to the neo luddites they they feel there's something wrong with technology and and this siphon your spiritual energy i don't think it's that uh i think it's it's something more interesting but highly problematic nevertheless which is addressed in the book that i suggest also uh, as a, a, a something a bibliography to deepen and to explore together uh, some aspects is the whole idea of supernormal stimuli uh, and uh, how they overran their evolutionary purpose. And a lot of things that are wrong uh, are, are connected to this uh, kind of problem, which I'm also not going to go into right now. Otherwise, I won't be able to uh, continue. But, but, um, but I, I really think... Um, it's it's fertile ground to uh, explore new new ways of thinking and uh, avoiding bottlenecks and dead ends. Um, and uh, there is also another concept of self uh, organizing entities, self organization, and it has to do with the emergence of patterns. And uh, if we want to build a city on the moon, we want to build cities on Mars, we want to build cities on the Lagrangian points, we want to build beaches and cities on uh, asteroids with lakes inside and small oceans with fish. If we really want to do that, then uh, it has to be a natural thing. Otherwise, it won't happen. Uh, naturally, it will fail. Uh, and there is, there are patterns. Uh, fractal math uh, describes some things which are quite interesting. And uh, in people that study the whole idea of emergence in nature, they notice that human endeavors, they have similar patterns. And uh, the beltways, the highways surrounding the cities, they grow by themselves, almost against the will of humans. Uh, and actually, Chris Rea, when he composed uh, that, uh, when he wrote the music, uh, This Ain't No Technological Breakdown, This Is The Road To Hell, he was stuck on a traffic jam for hours, and he lost his mind. And he started writing the music, which is very eerie. Uh, but but there is something there, I, I think. And sometimes... Musicians, uh, poets, artists, drawings, they get there first uh, in, in a way before it can be described and at the academic level in greater detail. Uh, and here you have the ice forming 
with fractal structures, and they're ordered. Uh, and there's order. Order and chaos is the chaotic structure that I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, superorganism touches us. We're in touch with it, with our clothing, with our smartphones. And, uh, and I thought this uh, small primate, uh, the way it's covered by uh, uh, some kind of spacesuit, uh, uh, illustrates the, the inescapable presence of, of, of the layers of that thing that is part of us. Uh, and of course, there's the whole dystopic notion of the hive minds, the Borg, uh, you will be assimilated, terminators, all kinds of dystopic uh, uh, visions of the human contact with such uh, an entity uh, that would really colonize us and, and turn us into what happened to uh, you know, the commander Picard on that science fiction uh, scenario, but but not necessarily. No, I, I have a different opinion. I, I think uh, this is from the movie Proxima, is the haptic uh, interface that allows humans to interface with robots. There's the images of the robonaut, uh, exoskeletons. Uh, so, uh, our our interaction with the uh, with the superorganism need not be uh, destructive necessarily, and uh, and it can be um, can be very fruitful. By the way, um, uh, the Moonwalk uh, project. Uh, one of the recent astronauts uh, that are in reserve from France. I I was with him in Marseille in underwater analog uh, efforts. Uh, and precisely what we were doing, I decided not to mention it in detail right now, but uh, that can be explored in greater depth in the future. Uh, in Project Moonwalk, it was exactly the work, teamwork between humans and robots. And so um, uh, this contact with uh, the super organism doesn't need to be a bad thing necessarily. Uh, but I do think it's inescapable, and and therefore, and even to build all the O'Neill cylinders, you will need uh, a level of robotics and human interfaces with machines uh, beyond anything that exists currently. Uh, and um, to illustrate uh, more what I would like to be the Sargasso uh, asteroid turned into an orbiting lake, I share with you two images. One is from a French comics, uh, the Pays Sans Etoile, uh, where you have an asteroid that has that has a uh, water, it has lakes on it, and it's a drawing. And that's the closest thing I could think of what I have in mind. The, this, these are old drawings from the 1970s. And, and you can see strange synthetic life forms, even some kind of corals. Uh, and and on the, you can see on the lower, uh, the membranes. Uh, I've been thinking about these membranes and uh, exploring ideas and things along those lines since, since 2003, when I presented the whole idea of ice crafts. And, and uh, this, this is uh, not exactly the same thing, but in many ways it illustrates, uh, for lack of a better image, that is, that is something that illustrates what I have in mind. And then, uh, more recently, in the Netflix uh, Death, Robots, and Everything, uh, there's an episode called The Swarm, and, and there you have the human spacecraft, uh, spherical spacecraft, uh, facing an asteroid that's alive, it's colonized by intelligent insects, and they have a hatch, a biological hatch. And this thing in that appears depicted in that uh, uh, Netflix uh, science fiction show is almost exactly what I've been trying to build <laughs> for a long time. And, and I've been waiting for things to develop more because 
but there's there's something there and, and the fact that the people with special effects were able to portray uh, a biological membrane uh, on an asteroid um, is quite interesting of course you can watch the the show you see small details the story is a bit you know about live mind versus human mind uh, which is a bit dystopic and dark, but that's not what I'm interested in that much. I'm more interested in the way the artists uh, portray uh, a hatch on, on uh, some kind of living the structure. Uh, and uh, talking about living structures, there's also another movie that I think, uh, if you haven't seen it, you might find it interesting, uh, The Fountain. Uh, where there's a spacecraft in the future that has a tree inside, and it's basically an ecosphere, a self-contained, uh, uh, and it's so advanced, it looks like uh, a totally poetic thing, but actually uh, some of the designs uh, that I've been toying around for years, and I know other people think about those things, even the ones that do the special effects, on this movie, uh, there's 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 part of the underground, and the idea of having the spherical living spacecraft uh, was described in uh, in various science fiction stories with seashells, with with all kinds of things. I'm not going to dwell on it right now, but I just want to point out that I'm not the only one dreaming about these these living things, and actually. The whole uh, uh, word, uh, the the first astro chicken, the the way uh, bio ships were described initially, the scientist that used the astro chicken was trying to uh, sort of poke fun at the idea itself, but he was fully aware that there's something there, and and that's something that is clearly not your mainstream spacecraft, all clean, uh, without mud, without water, looking like the 2001 Space Odyssey uh, Discovery spacecraft. Uh, but, but there might be other designs that are equally viable. And uh, those are just to, to launch a little bit, uh, the, to illustrate basically uh, the, the idea. Um, one of the things I've published on a small poster uh, has to do uh, with uh, these biomimetic design principles. But uh, Rupert Starr, that was working with the termite mounts and the moon-based design, he told me that he actually thought that some designs, they don't have to be biomimetic to be better designs. The, the whole, uh, should there be such a thing as a technium? Should there be such a thing as a super organism? Uh, it doesn't have to always be biomimetic. Uh, biological systems are incredible. They're very advanced. Uh, and, but uh, there's a, a, a preconceived idea that biological are better that, or the other ones are better, which is beyond the, the whole nature of the would be super organism should there be such a thing uh which i think there is but but anyhow this is just an example and uh i'm almost ending finally uh i just want to point out on on this uh european uh thing that's going to be uh, uh soon uh i found it very interesting that the water has a little tap uh, like we say in Portuguese, a torneira with a small drop of water. And uh, my comment is, it's, it's nice. Water is clearly part of the, the need to, to colonize space. But one drop of water won't do it. And I, I still think there's, you know, using uh, all kinds of strange uh, systems, uh, including the spin launch or the rail gun or... There's, there are ways to launch water into outer space. And by the way, water can be accelerated. Water can withstand huge accelerations that would not be, uh, no human would survive them. Uh, and, and anyhow, uh, to me, the, that water tap 
uh, highlights the fact that water in humans are connected by pipes, which comes back to the umbilical between the uh, scuba diver, well, the scaphandrist, and the astronaut, the, the, the water, and, you know, they, they were connected by a, a fuel, uh, fuel rouge, a connection. And that connection would be the, the technium in, in sometimes in the form of uh, water piping it is in, in this little logo next to the O2, you, you see the small water thing. I thought it was interesting. And okay, so finally, uh, also from the 2003, I, I, I pointed out many things about the ecospheres, <coughs> which are self-sufficient systems where you have uh, shrimp and uh, plants and they're closed and they live for a long time, several years without rotting. And, and uh, it was a symbol of the whole concept of the ice crafts, or as Buckminster Fuller would say, spaceship Earth. Uh, anyhow, so the other one is, is a drawing about uh, space tourism with a little aquarium uh, with some algae, or, you know, that's the way I saw it. Some people told me, no, there's no water in there. The safety belts, please. But anyhow, it, it illustrates a little bit the, the same uh, design issue. Uh, okay, well, so that's it. I, I, uh, I'm i finished. I hope it wasn't too long. I hope it was useful. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be uh, taking any questions you might have if there's enough time. Thank you. Thank you so much for this interesting lecture. Uh, if you could stop sharing the screen, then we can be seen. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it was a really, really amazing, interesting lecture. lecture and um, I like the, the connection or the bridge you built between art and science. Uh, I'm an artist and uh, I'm always interested uh, to build a bridge between art and science. That's why I. Uh, initiated this uh, webinar series uh, to get this connection and um, and uh, I'm fully aware of the visionary power uh, of uh, between art and science and um, and you have illustrated us here very nicely and um, yeah thank you for this because um, <clears throat> movies uh, have a really uh, can reach many people and um, uh, because they they have the pictures and uh, yeah they are depicting it in an uh, other way but uh, art always can reach people in an emotional way and uh, touch people by emotion and that's an important fact of science and we are not bounded at uh, exactness of science so we can be we have not to prove what we are doing. Um, Adriano, do you have any questions? Uh... Yes, of course. <laughs> I have too many questions, or, or maybe not exactly questions. I have, uh, your audio is very low. Your audio is very low, Adriano. Adriano, your audio is very low. My audio is low. Yeah. Uh, that's strange. Uh, let, let me hear. Yeah, me it's better now. Hmm. Let me check. Uh, yeah, better. Better. Is the is the. Uh, yeah, is the is the, the microphone that I use normally. However, uh, no more than questions. Uh, too too many thoughts uh, rise in my mind because your uh, presentation was really so fascinating and uh, uh, full of uh, uh, how can I say new ideas or maybe not new because you 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 said the. Uh, uh, there are that you are working with this from the 80s of the past century. Therefore, mm -hmm. I cannot say new, but maybe uh, very uh, quite uh, uh, rare to be listened in in the in the in the, in the discussions in the presentations about space exploration and settlement and and so on. And I think uh, so. The the first thing I would like to mention is uh, when you talk about. Uh, the uh, super organism and uh, you show the picture of some 
big cities on earth, Baltimore, I think, and mm -hmm. maybe Washington, yeah. uh, that are developing in, 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 on, on an almost fractal uh, There's method. academic studies about emergence and the geometry of cities. Yeah. They all look uh, so, alike in a way. Uh, thinking about the metropolis as a super organism, uh, there is a, a, a writer, a philosopher, who, who make this uh, hypothesis, uh, uh, and is Robert Piercing. I, I, I think you maybe know this, uh, this uh, uh, American philosopher. He's, he, he got two. Uh, he, he was a. a, a I need to check. I, I will. No, I want to read. Robert Piercing. Uh, yeah. The the the. Uh, the the Zen and the art of the modern. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, so um, you know that he he, he drafted a an evolutionary path coming from the inorganic to the organic to social to intellectual. So he he he, he said that uh, the, the history of life as we know mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, pass it through these four, four levels, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and each level introduces a new what he called a moral system. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. uh, and now, it, it, in one of his book, uh, is two books because uh, one is uh, the Zhang and the Art of uh, Maintenance of the Motorbike, and the other one is uh, Lila and Inquiring into Morality. Um, mm -hmm. He wrote that probably the fifth. Uh, uh, the the fifth uh, uh, level will be the the big city the mega the megalopolis. Mm -hmm. It will be the super organism that is will be the fifth level of evolution. Uh, Robert Pearson doesn't talk about space, and uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, maybe two or three years ago. Before uh, I couldn't ask him <laughs> what he thinks about space. But, uh, however, uh, I think that in our view of the, what we call the cosmic ecology, there mm -hmm. is no difference between a, a, a super, super city, uh, a big city, a megalopoly uh, mm -hmm. growing, out, growing up on Earth and the megalopoly growing out into space outside Earth. Because there's no difference. Everything is no, it's, natural. It's a Everything continuation of the growth of whatever is alive here. It's a continuation. Yeah, 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 exactly. But let me ask you, uh, you, you spoke about the whole morality issue. And there's a song, a popular song, which is a bit silly, that always fascinated me. Some singer that says, I was born, born to be alive. I said, what the hell? Born to be alive. Born yeah. to be alive. Really? And, 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 and sometimes people say, ah, humans are evil. Look at all the waste and the, um, the light pollution. Why the hell is that all that stupid light? That's pointless, so wasteful. And you say, no, the, the, the lamps, they just want to be. They want to shine for no good reason. <laughs> They're mindless. They, they, they are, you know, like, it's, if you start looking at, at what is... Uh, going around us and and you starting to gradually remove the human guilt like oh what we did to the environment no if we start slowly it's not that we're not responsible it's not that at all i think humans are are yeah the, the impression i had from, but, from from your presentation is it looks it looks like more as an artistic work your 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 work yes because i did say why i mentioned this yeah mm -hmm. yes yes exactly that's very very beautiful definitely however the impression i i had from the from my philosophical point of view mm -hmm. is that you are suggesting some way that uh, we are uh, biologically driven and that maybe we shouldn't be very much concerned about uh, taking the right decision, the right political decision to, to push the proper technologies and things like that. 
because however, life will expand. Mm. This is the, the impression that I have from, from the philosophical point of view of uh, your presentation. Yes, you think no. that we are biologically driven to expand. But mm. not the di diversity. Uh, diversity yeah. is uh, getting lower. Yeah, no, uh, yes and no, because you see pain, pain from a neurological point of view is our friend. If, if, if we hurt, if intelligent people feel the nightmares and feel the cruelty and feel <laughs> all the horrible things, that pain is part of the feedback loop of the system and humans uh, are the nervous system of, of this super organism. So... Uh, yeah. uh, the author, somebody Kevin call Kelly. Gaia. Somebody call it Gaia. Yes, no, but, but it, it, this is the, the two ideas are not mutually exclusive at all. The author that came up with uh, Kevin Kelly, the one of the editors of Wired magazine, uh, he has uh, TED Talks, he has all kinds of things. He thinks there's only one computer on Earth, for instance, that all computers are one computer and things along those lines. So, you know, but nevertheless, the point being Kevin Kelly, he argues that the human stomach cannot eat things that are not cooked. So even our biological, our eyes, our brains, everything, uh, our memory in the cloud, the internet, all those things, what we're able to do nowadays, like the three of us talking right now and all that, uh, that is part is a natural thing, uh, and and it's it's uh, part of a, a higher function, uh, a little bit like the prefrontal cortex, and and so uh, the the growth of a city would destroy the the planet, but uh, like a very hungry person will drink itself into oblivion because it's getting amused with alcohol. Uh, but the prefrontal cortex is, oh, please, you've had enough wine. Please, that's more than enough. Jeez, stop. Uh, so they're, 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 the, the, the two things are not... Uh, um, uh, uh, all the five years I was in Texas, I was exposed to this whole inherent depravity. Man, we're evil, and we're all going to go... You know, the whole idea... We're, and so that... Ah, Therefore, because we're going to go to hell and anyhow, we're evil. So there's nothing we can do real about human nature. So let's just amuse ourselves, destroy everything. And, and no, 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 I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think that at all. I, I, I think there's a danger. Um, and, um, and I think the, the, this uh, uh, super organism, uh, I used the word super organism because a friend of mine was doing some research. He said, if you ever use the word Gaia, you will never get any funding. Please note. <laughs> so he said, no, no, no. But th there's, there's, there's a solid bibliography at the scientific level uh, about, um, but it's, it's still exactly, it's not mainstream. It's, it's clearly an underground. It's still, um, you know, like some people say, hey, we're going to go to the moon. So again, really? No, no way. You're not going to go to the moon. Do, why do you want to go to the moon? You've been there. You, you know, and nowadays there's our team is orbiting, right? So, it's, and to me, to me, this, this whole uh, push towards Mars and, and the rivalry between the moon underground and the Mars underground is that the Mars underground requires more extensive mutations because it's very far away. Uh, and you need you know, uh, mutations like SpaceX that are clearly different from the other things and, and uh, in order to get there. So there is a thirst, uh, a need to, to extend like little uh, vine tendrils or tentacles of an octopus or something, uh, whatever image you want to use. But the whole dynamics between the various, the various undergrounds uh, where people say, hey, let's just focus on the moon. And yeah. th there, there is this umbilical, the, the idea that this possibility, should there be, I'm not going to say in superorganism necessarily, something along those lines. Okay, it doesn't have to be, you know, a big label or, or anything, but I, I really think there's something there. 
um, that's 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 what I meant to yeah, say. Yeah. So go, going going back to to understand where we 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 will go to live uh, uh, in space and what we will do and so on. Of course, mm -hmm. thinking about the moon and Mars, uh, there is no yeah on Mars there is a very thin atmosphere, not uh, uh, not enough to 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 protect ourselves from cosmic radiation and other things. Mm -hmm. And on the moon there is no atmosphere at all. Therefore, it seems obvious that life on the Moon and Mars uh, will go underground in order mm -hmm. to be protected from the radiations and to have a, a closed environment uh, to be mm -hmm. filled uh, with uh, breathable air and, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but going also back to the, the, the imagine that, that uh, I, I got from your presentation that you, it seems that uh, uh more or less the vegetable vegetable realm uh is to be considered very much more uh when we talk about expansion because uh, if we think that on earth uh vegetable life is 97 percent of, of the world life and we are and and uh, the, the, that three percent is the animal life and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that three percent, we are a very uh, small percentage. Uh, we humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it it is also logical to think that uh, thinking about uh, expanding Gaia, mm -hmm. it, it will be the, the the vegetable life that will expand, and we will be agent of the vegetable life. I remember Absolutely. when we when we talked together in in uh, uh, this summer in in uh, mm -hmm. Limbo. Yes. Yeah, you 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 propose to me an image that uh, really um, shocked me and and make me think that uh, you say that we the the uh, the visionaire the, the 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 astronautic visionaires let's say we are like uh, the 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 uh, the edge ah, yes the tips of, of the, the roots root, yes, of, the, yes. of the roots of of the of the of a plant yes. That Looking yes. for uh, for uh, for food in 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 in, 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 in on the underground. Yes, yes. And there's an Italian researcher, Mancuso. He's got a brilliant work on that. He works with Barbara Mazzoli. Yeah, Mancuso. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and no, there is a whole lot more there than um, than uh, absolutely uh, even. Uh, Look, uh, my mom already passed away, but she really liked the movie called uh, Silent Running, where there were greenhouses on, on, on a spacecraft near Jupiter. Those greenhouses are tiny. It's pointless. What I have in mind is a big forest, a huge lake, an orbital ocean. There, it's just yeah, it's yeah. counterintuitive. It's not your... Your, the way we were brought up with Biosphere 2 with the little white trusses, uh, you, you know, the Silent Running movie, right? The, the old movie from the 70s or 60s. It or could be, but it, it comes to so my small. mind. It's, it's some, wrong. It has to be other. much bigger. I mean, it's, it's a strange, it's, it's like when you, discover, when you land somewhere and you say, this, this asteroid's got the wrong composition. He says, well, I don't know. <laughs> That's what it is. It, you know, this is, uh, this is um, what I've been facing is counterintuitive things. Um, and uh, who, you know. who was those, that uh, author, I think was Larry Neven, could be science fiction. Yeah, right? the ring world, yes, I was big. Uh, uh, yeah, the ring world around the sun, sure. and it was completely vegetable. And, mm -hmm. and people uh, used to to live there in 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 this ring world and mm -hmm. and uh, being vegetable it generated its own atmosphere and and it was a uh, uh, yeah uh, several books uh, on on this subject of the ring world yeah very very interesting mm -hmm. and i think near or some way similar to, to uh, what... i i went on uh, in the atlantic ocean i went on an oceanographic expedition to sea mounts uh, and the seamounts have life, and the depths are barren, and life jumps from seamount to seamount. I do think that instead of the large O'Neill cylinders or the Stanford Taurus, like in the, the Elysium movie, 
I can see more like asteroids with beaches and small lakes and where people swim in huge swimming pools and really different kind of landscape, more like what happens in Dubai, you know, those the people say they're insane. All that sand that costs so much money, and they built the world in tiny little islands. No one, what, what was the business model? And and somehow, uh, what they're doing there? Because if you think about Dubai and the rich Arabic countries, uh, like in the Matrix, the city of the machines that they grows by itself. <laughs> And and they grow and they they want to go high into the sky. There are some beautiful pictures of the skyscrapers in Dubai coming from the mist, like some kind of spikes of uh, an animal or or some kind of trees or some sequoias. The whole thing it wants to the that Kevin Kelly author he wrote what technology wants and says technology is gonna get it. We got to deal with it and. And being a symbiosis like uh, lichens or polyps in the coral, or else this is going to get to us and we're going to be hurt because it's going to keep growing no matter what we do. And so we got to face it and whatever. So he, he is a, an editor of Wired Magazine. Wired Magazine wanted artificial intelligence to rule the United States, okay, when Trump was getting very... So they're very open-minded in terms yeah, of, of course there are ideas. Other uh, but, but what I'm saying, nevertheless, yeah. that there there is uh, those islands. I, I, I instead of that, uh, you you remember there were musics about island one. There's a, a music that I, I did not put here, but I want to mention. Uh, it's uh, about the lunar miners, and uh, it's uh, by a, a folk like a folk like John Bias, but for science fiction, a uh, folk singer. And she describes the moon, uh, the people mining the moon, uh, when, when waiting for the sunrise, the, the earth rise, actually, and then looking at island one. And then I thought, no, it's not island one. It's not a huge island. No, it's a lot of tiny little asteroids, like, uh, like the Greek islands, like some kind of zillions of tiny rocks with water and mud, little weird plants. And, and then a crust of uh, uh, leftover minerals from old spacecraft. I, I can, it, people say, what a dumb, is that the future, really? He says, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying that I, 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 I can, it all makes sense if you start thinking about it in a certain way that you, you start visualizing things that are a bit not your normal scenario because I do think spacecraft are too clean they're too dry. Uh, they, yeah. they don't have enough. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. To think about green, you know, green environment and, and water. No, they're like a plane. They're like a jet plane. People say, hey, on this Lear jet, you know how much it cost me to sit on this jet plane? And there's mud and there's bugs in here. What the hell? No, it's, it's, it was, no, no, no. It's part of, you know, it will feel better because if they renew the air and you can eat some, some of those bugs, uh, if you run out of food, something, <laughs> and and I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's just, um, it's just more like what some people in Texas said. Oh, so you're saying it's like a hippie paradise, right? He says, well, it's not like a hippie space station, but in the end, mm -hmm. so they, they were. So your astronauts will they be barefoot? Is that it? He says, well, why not? You know, if if the whole thing is stable enough, and that's why that uh, science fiction on Netflix, the design. Yes, uh, forget uh, about okay. microgravity, forget about mm -hmm. the weird bugs, but just some elements of industrial design on, on the way they imagine that uh, on the episode Swarm. Uh, I, I was just looking at it and say, look, you know, sometimes uh, science, you know, science fiction has a little bit of science. And the illustrators somehow uh, not, get not only a little bit of science. Uh, uh, we had a, a really very important webinar we made this this evening, mm -hmm. and I think we are going to to close. Maybe yes. Yes, uh, I, I wanted to add only that uh, not only a little bit of science. If you take Stanislav Lem, uh, he was yeah. also a scientist and. Uh, 
yeah, uh, he has foreseen a that. lot of things. And uh, all that is yeah. the, the living ocean. Yeah, that was thinking and doing psychoanalysis on the motivation. Yeah, and all the And they wanted to go back know. to at least in even in the end of Solaris. Where, where do they go? There's a house in an island, and they can go mm. to the beach, like in yes. contact in the movie yes. contact. They're also yes, on yes. the beach. I yes. don't know. It's just, um, there could be yeah, something. Yeah. Although it's very, very interesting, this topic. I, I would like to point out that um, next year will take uh, place uh, MetropolCon in Berlin. Uh, it's like a fair and um, yeah, look at MetropolCon uh, 2023. Uh, they are still organizing. You also can, could give a lecture there if you want to. Uh, you can register at the page. And um, yeah, uh, it's um, uh, about science fiction. And um, maybe it would be interesting for you to come. Uh, lectures are in German and in English. You can also give your lecture in English. Uh, the, um, the organizer or one of the organizers is uh, also a member in our um, uh, in uh, our academy, uh, Dominic Irtenkauf, and um, therefore I'm mentioning this. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your lecture, for the discussion and uh, this interesting topic. Uh, I'm really glad you, that you were here. And uh, I also would like to um, point out that we are um, a non-profit organization. We are all volunteers and uh, we had uh, recently our Giving Tuesday and uh, we are looking for support. If you will become a member of SRI, you are uh, invited to join us mm -hmm. and you also can donate uh, for SRI. Uh, maybe Adriano can put in the chat uh, the, yeah, sure. the, the link. Uh, 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 meanwhile, I'm talking and uh, our next webinar will be on the 19th of December. It's our special Christmas event. Um, so, yeah, our end of the year event. And uh, you're also invited <laughs> to, to join us and um, also to join us to the other webinars because we have uh, really uh, interesting topics. Uh, we are inviting uh, scientists, artists, uh, philosophers, um, engineers, and uh, to present uh, lawyers uh, to present their topic and uh, to learn from this and to build uh, the bridge between art and science. And um, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for joining us, for listening us, and I wish you a nice evening and a nice holiday days. Okay. Also, bye. Thank you everybody. Ad Astra. Ad Astra, ja, genau. <laughs>